So in the time we have left, let's steer the conversation a little bit to the position, the experience, the skill sets of a board of the future. And David, you know, maybe your comments, if you don't mind to kick off, I mean, you know, even in our, certainly in our business, we are seeing the rising uh, demand, if you will, for transformational experience, both in the C-suite, certainly in the boardroom. And, you know, are you also, from your vantage point, seeing those types of changes in your, in your board roles? And has the board and leadership dialogue evolved to, that, that now considers these new risks and opportunities that have come to the forefront during the pandemic? Absolutely. I think that the, the aperture has widened in terms of what boards look for when they're thinking about board design and composition. And whereas in prior years, the label CEO was used as a proxy for being board ready. And now that label has been peeled and now people are looking for specifically what are the competencies that they thought they were getting when they got a CEO <clears throat> that they want to add to their board. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, when you're doing board design, you might decide you want one sitting CEO on your board, but you probably aren't going to go back to the old mantra, which says you want an all city CEOs on your board. Um, you might want one audit partner, retired audit partner on your board, because that's a specific functional expertise and the viewpoint that you would have on your board, but you're looking around each one of those chairs, whether it's seven, nine, or 11, and you're designing in to that room, the voices that you want to be able to speak to your opportunities and challenges. And that also comes with respect to the topic we were just talking about with respect, with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, of trying to make sure that you have diversity across all dimensions, the Neapolitan ice cream, if you will, of gender, race, culture, age, functional um, expertise. And I, I think that that's going to remain um, and, and that's going to serve um, the boardrooms and the companies well. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, Diana, from, we just talked a little bit about some very specific transformational skill sets. So when the transferability of these skills into the boardroom, yes, it's probably happening, but how important it, have you seen um, in your board experience, past and present, um, that specific skill sets, whether it is audit committee, whether a retired partner, whether it is a global supply chain executive, how is that domain expertise becoming really additive to a board's composition? So um, David, his remarks were spot on, right? That most every board has a set of competencies and generally maintains a skills matrix that uh, it likes to see the full complement of its board members fill out the breadth of the matrix of what, what are the competencies that are important for this company and how it derives value, um, the voices that need to be around the table to help elevate the conversation. So. And, and to David's very point, an element of that is very often and, and increasingly is diversity across all dimensions, but it's also functional expertise in certain categories that are really critical to the functioning of the company. So yes, I think it is important and many boards have a deep functional expert that's usually a retired audit partner in finance and accounting. Depending upon the board, there's typically a lawyer or somebody with deep regulatory experience that, um, that comes to the table. Then there's usually a, a sitting CEO or recently retired CEO, a marketing executive, a supply chain executive, depending upon the industry. Again, you might have somebody that represents your customers or um, the industry that you, that you largely serve as, as the current business. And what I think is important is yes, as one is, um, completing their professional career and looking to pivot to board work. Yes, it's important, I think, to be known for your functional, you know, sort of vertical expertise, what that is. That'll be, in my experience, that's your calling card and that's your entry into the conversation. But what makes you a really effective board member, I think, as, as you get in the room is to be able to assimilate information really quickly and be able to think horizontally as a leader across the organization, bring the lens of whatever your functional expertise is, um, but be able to talk about a business issue with other smart, engaged people around the table that, that are coming at it with a, from a different functional expertise. So do I think functional 
uh, skills and experience and competency is critical. Yes, I do. Um, but then to, again, steal David's phrase, opening the aperture and making sure you're using the best of those skills in the broadest possible way is what I think makes you most effective. Thank you for that. So last question is coming to, to David and Gretchen. And then I, if you don't mind, maybe we can just abbreviate our responses a little bit because I think there's two interesting questions you, you all might wanna uh, be able to answer. First, um, what specific advice would you give to directors? Um, and I'm coming back to the very important subject of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. So what advice would you give um, seated directors today who are seeking to accelerate this DEI journey on the, for the companies on the boards they serve? I think David articulated this well before. I mean, one, you have to look around the rest of the, uh, the, the boardroom. If there's not enough diversity on the board, there's probably not enough diversity in the company. So the first thing you have to do is address the diversity in your board. Um, and, you know, just ask the question at every meeting, you know, what kind of progress are they make, making? When senior leader positions open up, are they considering, you know, diverse candidates? Um, you just have to question it all the time. And one thing that I found helpful uh, was that I, on, on a couple boards, I've uh, been asked to speak to the resource groups that they have, either women or minority resource groups. And if you're trying to, you know, if you have an objective to move women up the chain on the operations side, but if you go to the resource groups and there aren't any women in operations, that you're going to have a problem. But I think that's just a way to learn something about the company and the culture of the company. And I think non-diverse board members should volunteer to do that too. Thank you. David? I love that um, phrase that she ended on, uh, sort of a call out to non-diverse um, board directors. And my advice to new directors would be, one, white male directors lean in. You are uniquely positioned for other directors to hear you on this topic. And you should get prepared for the conversation in the same way you would do any other strategic imperative cyber, ESG, there's lots of information out there that can move you from being uncomfortable and lacking confidence because it's a topic you're not familiar with to getting up that learning curve relatively quickly by going on to the Center for Global Diversity and Inclusion and looking at the plethora of best practices that have been compiled on a global basis with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion and becoming, I won't say an instant expert, but much more comfortable. And for minority directors, it's a little more complicated, quite honestly, because there's always the risk of becoming labeled as the voice of diversity in the boardroom. And then people don't hear you on any other topic unless you're talking about diversity. Um, that being said, I think staying silent and staying on the sidelines has just as much liability. And so once again, I, I would say lean in. And I think for both directors, I think you should take a look at how your company is treating other strategic imperatives safety, quality, customer satisfaction, all of those things, and look at the gap that exists between how your company is treating those other strategic imperatives, how they're bringing those topics into the boardroom, how they're applying metrics to them, how they're not tolerating best effort, but demanding performance, and say, why aren't we doing the same thing for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Thank you very much. Well. We may only have time for one question, and Pat, I hopefully you you wouldn't mind leading us leading us off. Um, how are, how are your boards, and how have in your in your lens have you seen other boards determine when to take a stand or not to take a stand on public positions or political issues? Tough question. Um, I'll, I'll speak to my. Um, uh, well, both the healthcare and the banking, uh, we've taken stands on issues of race uh, that I would never have thought five years ago that a publicly traded bank would be talking about. Uh, but when the, 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 the fabric of our community, and we are a community bank, we're, I mean, we're from Louisville, Lexington, Northern Kentucky, but we began in Louisville. Uh, when we have watched um, the fabric get as torn and as shredded as it has over the last 12 months, both in reality, people getting hurt, riots, innocent people being killed, 
we couldn't stand by and 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 not and be quiet about it. And so our CEO uh, has spoken up. I mean, he's not carrying placards in downtown Louisville, but he's been a visible, vocal voice both with the dollars and in, in, in investment in our community and a voice uh, in our community on those issues. So I do think, in a, in a minute, I want to speak to the balance, but it, it is important to speak up. I think you got to choose your fights carefully, but this fight came to us and we weren't going to let our town be destroyed and, and, and continue to be willfully ignorant and blind. I'll speak as a white middle-aged male to issues that our minority uh, brothers and sisters and customers uh, we're suffering within our community, particularly at the hands of a dysfunctional police department. So we had to stand up and, and, and be counted on a host of, of issues. And the same thing, not on the race issue so much, but on the health care issue, uh, on the health care boards, I said, on, we had become a loud, noisy voice on the utter lack of uh, investment in health care facilities by public policymakers with Congress and state houses across the country. So Maybe that sounds reactive. Maybe it sounds like our hand was forced, but I think it was forced. And so we had to stand up and we've sort of been building the plane as we've been flying it this year, trying to figure out how to be meaningful uh, and thoughtful participate, participants in the debate and discussion. So that's one side of that whole issue. The other side is there's an interesting article in you still have to run a business and you still have to, you can't let your companies devolve into chat rooms. And uh, there's an interesting article in, I think, today's, it's either in today's journal or today's times, a huge, a, a huge and I don't have the answer to this, but a huge human resource debate that will come to both operating companies and up at the board level will be how much of this debate do you let go on down through the food chain in your, inside your companies that, that can be a distraction sometimes to getting the job done for your customers in the business. There were a couple of companies in the Wall Street Journal today that basically said they had outlawed all political discussion on their emails inside their company systems. I'm not sure how enforceable that will be, or maybe that's somebody's reaction to uh, what they think is too much debate going on, but it's a balance. I mean, you, you've got to stand up and be counted uh, in your community, I think, on issues that matter, uh, but you've also got to continue to operate your business. So I don't have all the answers. I'm just sharing with you some of the experiences I've had on it over the last 12 months. Oh, thank you very much, Pat. I think they yeah. uh, resonate with all of us particularly those of us who have lived in communities where this violence and, and these tragedies take place. So unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. So <clears> I <throat> want to thank Diana, Gretchen, David and Pat for a very thought provoking and engaging discussion. I hope that some of these topics and learnings and recommendations and observations will resonate with our audience long after today's discussion concludes. So. Thank you again to all of you and to our audience for joining us today. Please be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.